Pierce is a freelance author and journalist based in London, England. He has reported on environment, science, and development issues from 64 countries over the past 20 years. Trained as a geographer, he has been an environment consultant of New Scientist magazine since 1992. He writes regularly for The Guardian newspaper, is a frequent lecturer having spoken on six continents in the past four years, and is a regular contributor to US newspapers and magazines. Pierce's books have been translated into at least 14 languages. His books include When Rivers Run Dry, Confessions of an Eco Center, Earth Then and Now, With Speed and Violence, Deep Jungle, and The Coming Population Crash, published in April of this year. Please join me in welcoming Fred Pierce. Okay, thank you very much. Um, thank you, Jamie. Um, thank you for being here. Um, I think I probably ought to just say very briefly a word about uh, my take on, on the film that we saw before lunch, um, which was very powerful. Um, and I think very propagandist, really. Um, I, I agreed with much of what it said, but it started, I think, from the premise that privatization was the cause of most of the world's problems in water. Um, it it didn't never, never said that, but it kind of implied it just by the juxtaposition of, of the stories that it was telling. And it it's really isn't, I don't think, as simple as that. I don't think privatization is going to be a solution to the world's water problems, and it's going to make some of them worse. But I think you could at least argue that the water problems we face are as much to do with the failure of public management. In fact, I think there are predominantly a result of the failure of public and community management of water supplies. Um, and to lay it all at the door of privatization, which is uh, private sector is only responsible for managing quite small amounts of the world's water, I think was um, not quite right. Much of the, story, the stories it told were quite illuminating and quite interesting, but I, I think that perspective was a bit wrong. Um, but at any rate, I guess they started from that perspective in wanting to produce the film. I, in, for my book, I started from a rather different perspective. Um, I, as a journalist, I simply started by noticing a lot of stories in newspapers around the world, just kind of little one-paragraph stories, typically just saying uh, the Yellow River in China has stopped reaching the sea for six months or the Nile no longer reaches the sea or the River Indus in Pakistan is is giving out and the, all the mangrove forests at its mouth are, are, are dying out, that kind of thing. And I began to think that these weren't just kind of little single paragraph news story, that there was a big story here going on, the fact that the world's rivers were beginning to run dry. And the book, which is essentially a journey around the world to explore some of these rivers and to exactly find out, is, is a journey to find out what was going on. So I didn't start from a political perspective. I started from a what the hell's going on here perspective. Is there a big story that's not being told? And well, yes, the, so the, river title, the book title became When the Rivers Run Dry, which I guess is pretty um, self-explanatory. It tells why some of the world's greatest rivers no longer reach the sea. While the world's atlases, the one we, I'm sure you all use in, in class, no longer really tell the truth. Those firm blue lines on, um, on the maps describing rivers moving from the mountains through the plains to the oceans, well, in quite a lot of the world, it's not like that. Those rivers give out before they reach the ocean. The blue lines are no longer so, no longer so firm. Some of them disappear, and then another river comes in to take over the channel. There's a gap in the middle. So I wanted to explore that, and to explore what this tells us about the state of the global water supply and why, amazingly as it may seem, we could be running short of the most abundant material on the planet. So first, some numbers. And I think these are numbers which um, I hope will engage with you, certainly with um, your, your students. I know they engage with, with, uh, with water scientists. Wherever I go, people seem to take notice of these. Few of us, I think, realize how much water it takes to get us through the day. On average, we may drink uh, not much more than a gallon, probably, of the stuff. Even after washing and flushing the toilet, we get through 40 or 50 gallons, maybe a little more in the U.S., but that's what it would be typical in, in the U.K., where I come from. But that's just the start. It's only when we add in the water we need to grow what we eat and drink that the numbers really begin to rise. <clears throat> 
Try a few of these numbers for size. It takes between 250, 650 gallons of water to grow a pound of rice. That's more water than many households will use in a whole week just for one bag of rice. It takes 130 gallons to grow a pound of wheat, 65 gallons for a pound of potatoes. When you start feeding grain to livestock for animal products like meat and milk, the numbers get even more startling. It takes 3,000 gallons to go the feed for enough cow to make one quarter pound hamburger. Between 500 and 1,000 gallons for that cow to fill its udders with just one quart of milk. That number, incidentally, which um, I originally came across, the, the number for milk, I originally came across for a California feedlot. But when I went um, during the research for the book to India um, and met an Indian farmer who ran basically a dairy farm, but a very small one, he had a couple of acres of land. He pumped up water from underground to irrigate the fodder crops. Uh, he could tell me exactly how much water came up because he knew the power of his pump. He knew how many hours a day he pumped pumped up the water, it produced a certain amount of um, fodder crop which he fed to the half dozen cattle that he had at the back of his farm. And every morning, as I saw, he milked the, milked the animals and took the milk down to a dairy collecting point at the end of his road. So we had a completely self-contained system. We could work out exactly how much water he was pumping up in order to produce the, a given amount of milk which he took to the dairy every morning. And it worked out at just about 1,000 gallons of water for a quart of milk. So that's whether you're on a California feedlot or uh, in the deserts of India, similar number. Take those stats and turn them into meal portions and you come up with more than 25 gallons for a portion of rice, 40 gallons for the bread in a sandwich or a serving of toast, 130 gallons for a two-egg omelette or a mixed salad, 265 gallons for a glass of milk, 400 gallons for an ice cream, 530 gallons for a pork chop. And if you have a sweet tooth, so much the worse. Every teaspoonful of sugar in your coffee requires 50 cups of water to grow it, which is a lot, but not as much as the 37 gallons of water, which is about 600 cups needed to grow the coffee itself. We're all used to reading detailed technical information about the nutritional content of of our food on the food packaging, but I think it's probably time we started learning something about the amount of water that it takes to produce our food, because this is becoming a global problem. Now, I worked this out for me. I reckon I'm fairly typical, meat-eating, milk-guzzling, beer-drinking, Westerner. I consume roughly 100 times my own weight in water every day, I, I, I redid that calculation. I thought, you know, do I really mean a month or a year? Am I really talking about 100 times my own weight in every day? But I did. Um, and I redid the numbers again. I actually came up with 150. But let's stick with 100. 100 times my own weight in water every day, just to keep me going. If you do that over a year, it's about half the contents of an Olympic-sized swimming pool. Hats off to my vegetarian daughter, who gets by with around half that, and I guess time to go out and preach, preach the gospel for water conservation. We're going to be talking about that quite a lot. On the internet, you can buy jokey T-shirts. I've looked out for them. I don't have a slide, but I've looked out for them with slogans saying things like, save water, bath with a friend, um, which I like. I mean, that's a good message. I recommend doing that. But please don't buy the T-shirt because it takes roughly 25 bathtubs of water to grow enough cotton for one T-shirt. These are serious numbers. So where does all that water come from? Well, it comes from nature, of course. Most of the food and all the cotton that we consume, plus a lot of the animal feed, is grown using water collected from rivers or pumped from underground and delivered to fields. This is uh, an irrigation canal on the edge of the desert in northern Nigeria. Pretty typical sort of operation of an irrigation canal. Keep the crops fed, watered. Most of the world's rivers are already oversubscribed as a result of schemes of this sort. And that's our central problem. And increasingly, taking water out of the rivers is depriving somebody else of water. So water is now property, and whoever captures the water, controls that water, controls what goes on on the landscape. 
And if they're taking underground water, the people with the biggest pumps get the most water. So water is becoming a property resource, and that's changing our relationship with water quite a lot. This is the Kano Irrigation Project, as I said, in northern Nigeria, which grabs water from rivers that once watered a natural wetland on the edge of the Sahara, a place called the Hadejia Nguru wetland. Um, it's a fabulous place, actually, or was that wetland. I've visited it, it but it's dying. And millions of people who depend on it are, dis are losing their livelihoods and having to, having to depart and go to the city. They once depended on the fish in the lakes on the wetland, the wet pastures on the wetland, and the irrigation waters flooding naturally from the lakes, and the reeds that they harvested from the fringes of the lakes. And they built their homes, if not from the reeds, then from bricks made from the wet soils around the edge of the lake. There was an entire ecosystem, an entire social and economic system based around a wetland on the edge of the Sahara Desert. It's disappearing because the Nigerian government has decided to take all the water from, that, from the rivers that once supplied that wetland. Again, water has been taken from one group of people, people living a broadly sustainable lifestyle on the edge of the desert using available water and giving it to another group, an elite of farmers growing grain crops principally. Very inefficiently, I might say, if you do the numbers, um, that, money, that water would have been much more economically better employed going into the wetland. But that's not how the economics, or that's rather not how the politics work in that part of the world. So the Nigerian government, in the name of greening the desert, in the name of generating wealth for its economy, is actually destroying wealth and creating desert. But that's part of the politics of water. What does this mean for us? Well, that's, that's a local example, but I think the water footprint of Western countries on the rest of the world deserves to be taken more seriously. Our own personal footprints and our national foot footprints. Take another example. Well, I've talked about cotton before. Cotton grows best in hot lands with virtually year-round sun. Deserts, in other words. But cotton needs huge amounts of water to grow. In order to grow cotton, rivers are being emptied. Pakistan consumes more than two-thirds, excuse me, more than a third of the flow of the river Indus through Pakistan just to grow cotton. So much that much of the year no water empties, uh, no part of that river enters into the Arabian Sea. Australia, something similar on the Murray-Darling Basin. Many parts of the world, many rivers are being emptied just to grow cotton. That's a fairly typical cotton field in Uzbekistan. Russia transformed the deserts of Central Asia into a vast cotton plantation half a century ago. You're going to hear more about this tomorrow, so I'll only mention it briefly. But that began the destruction of the Aral Sea. Many of us will have seen pictures of the dried up um, bed of the Aral Sea and the hulks of old ships sitting on the sand. Um, the Soviet Union's demand for cotton did that. But not just the Soviet Union. It's in the last 20 years since the collapse of the Soviet Union, that system has been carried on by the private sector. Um, Uzbekistan is sec the second biggest cotton exporting country in the world and the world's biggest per capita user of water because of that cotton production. Uzbekistan is a vast user of water to grow cotton. Check your clothing later. Look at the labels in your clothes. If anything says made in Bangladesh, and much of our clothing today does, uh, most of the cotton to produce clothes in Bangladesh is grown in Uzbekistan. So if your clothing says made in Bangladesh, it was made in part using cotton, which helped to empty the Aral Sea. And the Aral Sea has emptied in a big, big way. This is a man standing, a water engineer actually, though he hasn't, hasn't got much water to engineer, standing on the shores of what was the Aral Sea at a town called Minak, which is a holiday resort and a fishing port until the 1960s. You would have to walk from that spot 100 kilometers, about 60 miles, in order to find the sea today. It's retreated that far. 
What was once the world's fourth largest inland sea is now just a few saline pools a very long way away from the old shore. Cotton did that. Just growing cotton, nothing else. Other water-guzzling crops are having similar kinds of effects around the world. Rice or sugar cane, fodder crops like alfalfa, also extremely thirsty crops. Two-thirds of all the water, roughly speaking, two-thirds of all the water that we as humans take from nature around the world is going into agriculture. Much of it for our food, but some of it for cotton and increasingly for things like biofuels. That's something I'll return to. So water, which used to be thought of as a great unlimited resource, it's really hard to believe that we might be getting to run short of this stuff. Um, and yet, because of projects such as this, because of our demands on water such as this, major rivers of the world, like as I mentioned, the Indus and the Nile and the Yellow River in China, the Rio Grande and the Colorado in the US, the Murray in Australia, many others running dry for at least part of the year. Major rivers of the world running dry, literally. In much of the world today, it is water rather than land which is the limiting factor in food production. So how have we come to this? Um, well, though our planet is still largely covered in water, we're coming up against, as I say, practical limits to the amount of fresh water that we have. Um, now, Pam talked to you earlier about the, about the water cycle. I'm not going to go much through that, but I'll just offer you that graph, which essentially is the same thing that uh, she was telling you about where the water on our planet is. 97% of it is seawater. Um, of the remaining fresh water, two-thirds is locked up in ice caps and glaciers, and most of the rest is in the pores of rocks underground, underground aquifers. Much of that water is deep and unavailable, or it's contaminated with salt or arsenic or fluoride. Um, millions of people in Bangladesh today are now drinking underground water laced with arsenic. They didn't realize until a few years ago that was the case. They've been persuaded not to drink polluted surface water and to start sinking wells, and it took many years before anybody realized that the underground water was polluted with naturally occurring arsenic. This is not human pollution. So not all the underground water is safe or uh, sensible to use. As I say, often it's deep or unavailable or contaminated. And most of it is not being replaced by the rains. We're simply over-pumping where we're pumping. So our main source of water is at the Earth's surface. Moving water, the stuff that nature constantly replenishes the water cycle by evaporating from the oceans and returning it to the Earth in new, clean rain. In other words, the water that's in our flowing rivers. That's our renewable resource. The natural water cycle is essentially still recycling the water that we've always had on the planet. If you like, the waters that uh, dinosaurs bathed, that uh, um, you know, Christopher Columbus uh, cleaned his teeth in, whatever, whatever you care to use. It's the same stuff. And it's the basis of life on Earth and of our civilizations. I worked out some numbers, exactly how much water we have, this renewable water coming down our rivers, how much we have to use every year. As I say, it is renewable. It does keep coming back. There's only so much going through the system in a year, so much that we can get our hands on. Difficult unit, if you can cope with the cubic mile, um, if you're gonna, I don't know, if we can imagine a cubic mile, I have difficulty doing it, but try and cope with the idea of a cubic mile. There are about 9,600 cubic miles of water making the journey from the land to the sea every year on the earth. Some of this flows directly off the land without reaching rivers or it shoots down gullies that form where it rains. Um, a lot of what is in the rivers flows in sparsely populated regions where it's difficult for us to get our hands on it through uh, the north into the Arctic Ocean, for instance, um, or in the rainforests, so about the three largest rivers on the planet, the Amazon, the Congo, and the Orinoco, all run through largely uninhabited rainforest regions. If you take out these basically inaccessible surface flows of water, we're left for practical purposes and with current engineering technology with around 2,200 cubic miles of renewable river water for our needs in a year. That still amounts to about 
if you work it out, about 1,500 cubic yards a year for every citizen on the planet, which doesn't sound bad. But remember, I calculated my own annual water use at more than 2,000 cubic yards. So I imagine most of the world wants to live like me and consume what requires the, the same kind of things that I do. So we begin to have a problem. This is a very crude calculation, and it leaves out crops that are grown from uh, using rain rather than abstracting water directly from rivers and underground water. But it gives you a sense of where we are. Maximum supply, 1,400 cubic yards per person per year. Fred Pierce's annual water use, something over 2,000 cubic yards a year. If everybody wants to live like me, if everybody wants to live like you, we have a real problem here. We're coming, up, we're coming up against real limits to what until recently had seemed an inexhaustible resource. So what kind of a problem is this? Well, it's partly and in places a crisis caused by climate change. That's certainly a major issue now. For instance, the Colorado and the Rio Grande um, receive much less water in rainfall on their catchments than they did even a decade ago. Uh, the Yellow River in China similarly... Um, that's a picture taken in uh, the Chihuahua Desert in northern Mexico. Um, the land behind this guy it used to be irrigated farmland, but no more. There's no water in the river that once supplied that, so there is no irrigation going on there anymore. There are more and more places around the world where climate change is stopping us to do what we used to do with water. Across huge swathes of the planet, from North Africa through the Middle East into Central Asia and parts of northern China, there is less rain than there was. And if that is due to man-made climate change, and the evidence suggests that it is, um, then we can expect the trend to worsen. Um, it's going to be hard to predict exactly what the effects of climate change are going to be on rainfall around the planet. I'd, I'd advise you to be a little bit careful of, graph, of maps like the one that Pam showed you earlier. I'm sure Pam would agree with this, that um, different models make, climate models have different predictions about how climate change will influence rainfall patterns. But there is, as, as she mentioned, a, a central thing which we can be fairly sure of, which is that the, in the future the wet areas are going to get wetter and the dry areas are going to get drier. So there's going to be more problems like this one in northern Mexico. So climate change is going to be an increasing problem. It's going to create increasing threats. Not, well, it, it, partly because the water won't be there, and partly because we won't know whether the water's going to be there or not. How do you build a dam for 30 years ahead if you don't know what the rainfall is going to be doing over the next 30 years? Um, but right now, the crisis is even greater as a result, not of any climate change now or in the future, but our huge demands on the world's rivers. We are in places taking two, three, or even four times more water from the rivers than we did just a generation ago. And this is for now the prime reason why those rivers are running dry. And there's a big and surprising reason for this. It's the flip side of a success story, or what I would call a success story, the Green Revolution. I'm old enough to remember back in the 1960s and the 1970s when the great fear was that the world would not be able to feed itself. It was rather like we talk about climate change today. It was the one big factor coming up on the horizon, the one that was really the, the, you know, the dominant global concern. Population, we were told then, was going to double within 30 years. How on earth, I remember thinking this in school, how on earth are we going to double world's food production? It didn't seem possible that we could do it. Paul Ehrlich wrote a famous, famous book back then called The Population Bomb, in which he said the battle to feed the world is over. Billions will die in the 1980s. And that reflected a quite widespread uh, concern. Really, you know, the game was up as regards feeding the world's population. Well... It didn't quite happen that way. Well, part of it did. Actually, the world's population did double in 30 years. But so did food production. Scientists came to the rescue they, with this green revolution. They produced a new generation of high-yielding crops that have kept the world fed. But it now turns out that those super crops use much more water, in many cases, than the supposedly inefficient crops 
that they replaced. So the Green Revolution produced crops that basically responded very far, very well to inputs of, well, inputs of all sorts. They needed lots of pesticides, they needed lots of fertilizer, and they needed lots of water. The other two are talked about. Water's been talked about rather less. But if you measured how much crop you got on a given amount of land, the Green Revolution was a success. Bumper yields per acre. If you measured how much crop you got per unit of water, many of these crops were producing less than the old crops that they replaced. So while the world grows twice as much food as it did 30 years ago, it takes roughly three times as much water to grow it. We thought we were going to run out of land to grow food. Instead, we're beginning to run out of water. One thing that happened as a result of the Green Revolution was a massive increase in the exploitation of underground water reserves. Many parts of the world that used to grow their crops from surface water, taking water from the rivers, well, the rivers, they dried up. So they're now using much, much more, much greater reliance on underground water. I took a long look at India, um, which is prominent in this. Now, India, is, again, is a success story in, in terms of feeding, feeding the country. Forty years ago, back in the 1960s, India was a center of famine. You know, there were big headlines about regular famines in India. Millions could die. Today, it feeds itself. Most years, it exports rice, but at great cost. It's done it because of the Green Revolution, the new high-yielding crop varieties. But it's using so much water that the river water, the rivers are basically empty, and fully half of India's crops are now grown using irrigation from underground water. Just one picture here in Bengal, but you can see that all over India, water being pumped up from underground in order to be diverted onto their fields. Farmers are taking from underground, and I'm sorry I'm coming back to this cubic mile unit again. Farmers in India are taking from underground 30 cubic miles more water every year than the rains replace. They actually pump up about 100 cubic miles. Rain, rain, rainwater replaces quite a lot of that, but they're pumping up 30 cubic miles more than the rains replace. Wells are emptying. That's an old hand-dug well. Those are steps down into the well. It's a large structure I came across in Gujarat, but they're, they're all over India. Uh, in the old days, that would have been pretty much full. Now you can walk down the steps, and indeed further down, you can't really quite see it in the pictures. Right down to the bottom, no water. Water tables underground in India are going down, down, and down, typically several meters a year. India's Green Revolution is living on borrowed water and on borrowed time, therefore. The crash is going to come, it, not everywhere at the same time, of course. Water is a very local resource, but it will come. And dozens of other countries, particularly in Asia, are going to go much the same way. They're over-pumping their water reserves so much. For the first time in history, China today, the world's most populous country, can no longer feed itself for lack of water. Not land, but water. While there is a global water crisis what we mostly see is a series of local crises. So we see somewhere in India that can't feed itself anymore because it's run out of water. Somewhere in China, somewhere here, somewhere there's a drought somewhere. We've seen these local crises around the world, water supplies drying up. Now, one way the countries around the world, as they hit these points, get around them is trade. Not in water itself. That's too expensive to transport and far too heavy. If you've ever picked up a bucket of water, you'll know that. Um, but in the crops, the water grows for us. Remember how much water I was saying was embedded in a ton of wheat or something. Um, you can plot this. You can map how the world's water is being traded around the world in the form of food. That's a crude map. It shows some of the major journeys. Uh, that what economists now call virtual water, meaning the water embedded in crops. So every ton of wheat arriving at a dockside carries with it in virtual water. Water, virtual form, a uh, thousand tons of water that we needed to grow it. So there's a map, as I say, of, of some of those major trades. Now, this is good news. The Middle East ran out of water to feed itself some years ago. It's the first major region to do so in the history of the world. 
Today, more virtual water flows into the Middle East each year in the form of imported water than flows down the River Nile. Uh, some people now say that Egypt would require three River Niles in order to feed itself, which it obviously can't do. So this is good news. Countries rely on this. A whole of the Middle East region relies on food imports. Iran and Egypt and Algeria would starve otherwise. Water stress Jordan, uh, which effectively imports between 80 and 90 percent of its water in the form of food, is perhaps the worst affected of all. That's an empty reservoir that I came across in eastern Jordan. Uh, somebody is just pumping out from that into that tanker there, the last water there. Um, clearly an unsustainable use of water. So without the virtual water trade, there would undoubtedly have been major water wars in the Middle East in the last 30 years. The region is dependent on other people's water. And that's fine, but this, the, the world's water trade carries on through the form of food crops. But that trade carries real dangers because it's turning, I think, a series of local water crises into a global crisis. A global crisis not specifically about water, or not obviously about water, but about food, about whether we can grow enough food. In a future world of water shortages, countries that rely on importing virtual water could be in trouble, I think. The global virtual water trade is equivalent to the flow of about 20 River Niles. And of that, two-thirds is used in a huge range of crops, from grains to vegetable oil and sugar to cotton. Now, some of it is in you know, industrial products, but most of the virtual water trade is in these basic crops. Um, approaching a tenth of all the water used in raising crops around the world today gets internationally traded in this form. Who are the big importers and exporters? The biggest net exporter of virtual water, the biggest grower of crops, thirsty crops to be exported around the world, is the United States. The U.S. exports around a third of all the water that it withdraws from the natural environment in the U.S. Much of that is in grains, either directly or much of it as in, to grow fodder crops to sell meat. So to do this, the U.S. is drying up rivers like the Colorado and the Rio Grande. That certainly exports is one reason why you're destroying your major rivers. Um, here is a little shot I took of um, in El Paso of the Rio Grande. We're about 300 miles, I think, from the ocean there. That's all that's left of the Rio Grande. This is in this concrete channel uh, by the border with Mexico. In fact, that day the water was flowing gently uphill. There was so little water in the river that a a, a wind coming up from the Gulf of Mexico was actually blowing the water uphill. The river had been destroyed to grow crops, uh, some of which was exported. The U.S. is also emptying critical underground water reserves like those beneath the high plains. Uh, Pam showed you a, um, a pretty scary pair of maps of water in the Ogallalo Aquifer, one of the world's largest water reserves underground, largely being destroyed. Um, to grow crops, some of which are exported. Now, I think the U.S. might in future think that it doesn't want to export its water in this way, and the U.S. might think that it doesn't want to be a major supplier of food crops around the world. Uh, and if the United States takes that view at some point, the rest of the world will uh, have cause to be extremely worried. Not least my own country. Uh, in England, we import very large amounts of virtual water in crops from around the world, about 40 cubic kilometers, which I can't quite immediately translate into cubic miles, but it's probably a bit about something like 15 or 18 cubic miles of water, which Britain alone imports. Most European countries are big, ex or big importers of other people's thirsty crops, crops grown with other people's rainwater. And you can see how this is playing out. The global, remember the global crisis or the price spike in major world foods around uh, two years ago, in 2008. Lots of food riots around the world as uh, grain prices, bread prices went up three or fourfold. Big panic around the world. Caused principally by droughts um, in Australia and all parts of Europe as well, which reduced food stocks and helped trigger those price rises. Um, since then, there's been a lot of land grab going on, people trying to secure their future food supplies by uh, buying up farmland around the world. 
And really that was a water grab because what happened in 2008 was that a couple of places around the world ran out of water because of drought in order to grow the crops they would normally grow for export. That triggered a huge price spike. So in that way, a, glo a local water crisis was translated into a global surge in food prices. And I think around the world we're going to see more and more of that. So water, local water problems, water is a local resource, but local water problems are more and more going to be turned into global issues. We're going to hear a lot more about this. And that's before, really, we start talking about biofuels, because biofuels are also very thirsty crops. And if the world is going to get in a big way into growing biofuels, we have to ask the question, do we have enough water to grow both food crops and biofuels? And cotton as well. I think we're going to have to think about that. Do we have to give food the priority over biofuels? Do we have to stop growing cotton? What should we do? Well, I'm going to go through one or two options. Um, maybe we should just increase the amount of water that we have uh, available to use around the world. After all, there's a lot of water, not least tied up in the oceans. So desalination. Desalination of seawater is certainly an option. Uh, the technology has been... It's fairly mature technology, but it's still developing and prices are still coming down. Israel has got the price of its desalinated seawater down to about 50 cents for a cubic meter of water, which is quite competitive with, um, at any rate, some other sources of water. Um, so that's a main source of... Desalination is, after all, quite common for supplying water to cities in the Middle East. It began in Saudi Arabia and Kuwait on a large scale, now moving on to Israel. Roughly 3% of drinking water supplies around the world today come from desalination of seawater. My guess is that that percentage will increase as the years go by. And you can see in Florida and California, people are building desalination plants for regular supply of water. In Cape Town in South Africa, Perth in Australia, big cities coming to think that they need desalination. Even in my own city in London, we recently completed a small desalination plant, not for regular use, but in, as a backup in case of major droughts. So desalination is a technology that's spreading around the world. There are two basic means that you desalinate seawater, one of which is you simply boil the water. So you, you boil it off and you collect the evaporated water and you get rid of the salt that way. The other way is to have um, filtration systems, sometimes called reverse osmosis, but basically it's an advanced form of uh, filtering to get rid of the salt and leave you with clean drinking water. The problem with both technologies, and the reason why desalination is likely to continue to be quite expensive, is they're very demanding of energy. Uh, so environmentalists certainly would have a concern about relying on desalinated seawater simply because of the amount of energy being used. But I think everybody would be concerned that it's rather expensive water. So it's okay for urban use, but it's never going to be of use for the the really big water demands, uh, principally agriculture. And certainly the dry regions of the world which rely most on agriculture water are not going to be in a position to grow their crops at any sensible price using desalination. So what else? Well, everybody would love to have large dams. The round the, that's the Hoover Dam. This probably is still a demand for some more large dams around the world. They have huge downsides, and we've heard something about that. Uh, you know, there's a section in the film that we saw before lunch, and much of what was in that is true. Is true. These get into the business of appropriating both water and land. If you build a dam on a river, you have control of that river. You can decide what to do with that water, and anybody downstream who disagrees with you, well, bad luck. Um, so it's a me it is a method of privatization or at least controlling water supplies. And you're also taking land from huge numbers of people whenever you're flooding, as it usually is, fertile river valleys in order to create your reservoirs. So while I think there will be more large dams, um, and engineers and politicians and financiers and the World Bank and everybody else are always very keen on them, I don't think there's that much uh, there are not that many places in the world where new, large, valuable dams are going to be built. And we have to think about this. What is the point of more dams when the rivers are already drying up, when all the water is already used? A global study published a couple of years ago 
uh, show that a quarter of all the world's population now live in river basins where the water is already fully allocated or indeed over allocated. So new developments, new dams in these areas are only going to take water from one set of users and give it to another. Now that may serve various political agendas locally, but it is not going to do much good for the community as a whole. Dams at that point become sources of conflict over water rather than anything else. So if many rivers are already exploited to their limit, triggering conflict sometimes, what else can be done? Well, engineers go to the next stage. They think about now about moving water from one river system to another, from one river basin to another, from wet regions to dry regions. And it's possible, but it's very expensive. It's expensive in terms of building infrastructure, and it's even more expensive in terms of pumping the water, the distances, and especially the vertical distances that you need to move water from one river basin to another. China is currently spending $60 billion dollars on a series of vast canals to pump water from its wet south to the arid north to refill the Yellow River. Now, that's the Yellow River on a good day. Um, but that river, which is not that big, actually, is, is um, trying to provide water for a huge area of northern China, the breadbasket of the world's most populous country. And it simply can't do it. There isn't enough water. So they want to pump water from the wet south. Um, but as I say, at huge, huge cost. India, its river's running dry in much of the country, especially the west and the south, is talking about doing a similar thing to move water from the wet, monsoon-fed uh, rivers of the north, like the Ganges, into the drier southern and western regions of the country. The price tag on that is being put at $200 billion. Huge sums of money, even for a fast-developing country like India. And that's just the capital cost. That's nothing to do with the pumping costs every year, just the capital costs. So I think this is madness. It's certainly, it may be good business for engineers, but I suspect that it will rarely be the answer for farmers. Water, as somebody said in that film, uh, is a very local resource, and it's going to remain a very local resource. And I think we have to look for local solutions, not grand engineering schemes. Um, two things I think need to happen. First, we need to get bat better at catching the rain where it falls and before it disperses. And again, the film had some interesting stuff to say about this. It's very valuable and very true. Local rainwater harvesting projects. If you like, it's a version of what um, certainly back in the UK people used to do in their back garden, which, which is just collect the water that came off the roofs and put it into, into, a, into a drum of water. And, you know, we've got some drums out the back there. Collecting water as in when it falls. Makes a lot of sense. Um, now here, this is a village in Gujarat, one of the driest parts of India. The guy in the picture is the local policeman um, who organized rainwater harvesting system. The lake behind him used to be desert, essentially, certainly very dry fields. It is now, that is the water collected, the rainwater that fell on that village in the last monsoon season, collected now by them for use for their crops in the coming months until the next monsoon season. That's for one village of about 5,000 people. It allows them to grow a second and a third crop where they once, before, once uh, could only grow one. The policeman here told me all the other villages around in that part of the country regularly relied on water tankers from the government during the dry season in order just to fill their taps, let alone watering their crops. They'd, they'd uh, literally, you know, they'd starve without. They'd, they'd, uh, they couldn't survive without. His village, for 10 years since they built that system, really a basic, very basic system with just a few channels and a few mud walls to direct the rainwater. In the last 10 years, they have never had to rely on water tankers. They were extremely proud of that. They're richer. They're certainly better fed than they used to be before. Everywhere can do that. Hundreds, thousands of villages in different parts of India and in China, too, are now developing local rainwater harvesting systems. It's in catching on in Africa, too, and indeed in the U.S. You go to Austin in Texas, you'll find rainwater harvesting systems out there. People are doing this just because it makes sense. 
These guys in India, they often don't leave the water in the lakes because it will, part of it will evaporate if you do that. Well, often they pour it down their old wells, like that big old well that I showed you before with the steps on. They pour it down their wells to recharge the underground aquifers, and they pump it up during the dry season to grow their crops without destroying their underground water reserves. Makes so much more sense. I mean, what was happening here is that the monsoon rains were falling onto the fields, flowing off into gullies and into rivers perhaps, flowing off their land, going downstream, downstream, downstream until it was caught by some large government reservoir. And the government, if it did, was then pumping the water back up the hill in order to irrigate their crops. And most, most often the water never got did pump, pumped up back the hill. And if anybody got the water, it would be a large landlord rather than a local village. So not only is this more efficient, it also gives local villagers control over their own water supply, and the politics of that is really important. They have control. They can manage their water, and it means they think about how they use their water. If they know how much water they've got, they think about, shall we grow those really uh, thirsty crops, or shall we grow some other crops? The whole politics of local areas changes. And it's more efficient in, uh, if you like, in strictly hydrological and in economic and energy terms, however you manage it, man measure it. Rainwater harvesting, the traditional method of collecting rainwater in much of Asia, makes much more sense than imported Western methods using large dams. There are other things that we can do. Um, intervening in parts of the water cycle. Um, Pam showed you earlier, those, when she started her talk, those coastal fogs on California. Now, actually, you can harvest those fogs. It's been done in Chile and elsewhere. You put up what amounts kind of net curtains um, across hilltops, and you can actually uh, get the, the droplets of water to form on the nets, and you can collect the water and provide rain that way. Innovative ways that we can use to capture water in different parts of the water cycle. But I think more than supply-side solutions, we actually need demand-side solutions to our water problem. Most, mostly everybody thought, how can we get more water, rather than how can we use the water we have more efficiently. And what we really need is a revolution in how we use water. Now, luckily, there are huge gains to be made. Um, in the home, we all know how to do that. Even the U.S. has managed low-flush toilets in the last few years. Um, you used to be the world's largest per capita user of water. Now Canada has that title. Um, the only thing that's happened is that U.S. has adop adopted low-flush toilets in the last few years. Urban areas need to save water just by plugging the leaks in their water main systems. Um, many water main systems lose 30 or 40 percent of the water put into them before they get to consumer taps. Just sensible management of water. I, I noticed I was staying at the, um, the, the guest house on the campus yesterday when it was raining. Big storm of rain yesterday morning. I looked out of the window of my room half an hour later. Overlooks tennis courts. Hard tennis courts, not grass or anything. Hard tennis courts. The tennis courts were covered in pools of water. And there was, they were being irrigated. There was a spiral system which is irrigated. You know, presumably in the dry weather, they, they wanted to do that to keep the dust down or something. But it was a completely insane image of a flooded tennis court being irrigated as if it hadn't rained for three months. I don't know who manages that. Um, but, you know, there are just so many ways in which day-to-day -day management can reduce the amount of water that we use. But urban use of water, well, that's one thing. But the really, as I said earlier, the really big use of water is in agriculture. And it's in agriculture where we need to use water massively more efficiently. So I guess the bad news is that we use water in agriculture ma very, really very inefficiently indeed. But the good news is that we could do it so much better. Um, tens of millions of farmers around the world, including in the most arid, the most water-starved parts of the planet, still irrigate their crops basically by flooding their fields, just covering them with water in the expectation that some of that water will get to the roots of the crops. 
In practice, most of that water evaporates. Um, some of it will percolate underground, and, well, maybe you can pump that back up again. But most of it will evaporate. Somebody else will get it, I suppose. You know, it'll go back into the water cycle, and it will rain on somewhere else. But for practical purposes, locally, and probably in that river system, that water is lost. Yet cheap systems of drip irrigation, basically putting water, not just spreading it across the field, but putting it into pipes, pipes with holes in that will deliver the water close to crop roots. Not expensive systems. You don't have to have all control systems. You can do it quite cheaply. Drip irrigation systems can cut water demand for crops by 40 or 50 percent, sometimes even 70 or 80 percent. And yet, even in some of the most water-starved parts of the planet, it is not done. It's insane. Large reservoirs also lose large amounts of water. A statistic I came across researching the book, the amount of water that evaporates from Lake Nasser, which is the lake behind the High Aswan Dam in Egypt, the huge dam on the Nile built 50 years ago, the amount of water that evaporates from that reservoir would keep the UK, my own country, give it enough water for an entire year. In other words, you could provide everything for industry and agriculture and homes for 60 million people in Britain with the amount of water that just evaporates from that reservoir. In the tropics, evaporation rates from reservoirs are absolutely huge. Again, it's insane. So as I say, I'm a pessimist and an optimist. I'm a pessimist because by and large we use water so wastefully, uh, resulting in, well, that's just, uh, I quite like the bird um, uh, footprints on it. But anyway, dried up mud, dried up reservoirs, that one's in Jordan. We get scenes like that all over the world. But as I'm an optimist because I can see that we could do things so very much better. We do have enough water, I believe, on the planet to do what we need to do, but we just need to manage it an awful lot better. So to conclude, I guess water is a resource like no other. Organizing its supply and distribution is a task like none other. Um, it's something that it's a commodity, but it's also a human right. And that was something which was touched on really persuasively in that film, but I think wasn't resolved. It said, yes, water is a human right. Yes, it absolutely has to be a human right. We have to find ways of persuading people to use it better. We have somehow to ensure, yes, universal access, but we also have to encourage communal efforts at conservation, maybe at the village level, like those rainwater harvesting systems, and also probably, I think, price incentives to penalize misuse and encourage more efficient water use. And maybe the market sector does have a role to play in that. Um, I kind of feel that we're, as a communities were actually less good than we used to be at managing this kind of things where you need to have a price mechanism but you also have to have a human right people have to be able to have access to basic resources but also you have to use market forces in order to stop them wasting that water i kind of think that we're getting worse and worse at doing that um so that's a tough ask and i think it's basically a government task or a governmental task how do we manage things so that we can use the water that we have on this planet more effectively? Water, they say, is the new oil, that it will cause water wars in the 21st century. Well, that may well be true. Um, I certainly don't rule that out. But look, water is more than oil. It's more than that. We could get by, by without oil at a push. If we had to, we could get by without oil. We could not, any of us, get by for more than a day without water. So I'm going to stop there. Thank you. And let's do some questions. Sorry, I spoke a bit longer than I intended to, but let's have some questions. There's one here. Hey. <clears throat> so why is it that uh, in that community in India, they built um, that rainwater harvesting basin, whereas place, uh, a harvesting basin, a rainwater harvesting basin is not built in places like California, Arizona, where there's you know, also a big need for water? I, I think, yeah, that's a good question. I think because we just have a, a kind of paradigm of how we think, a very restricted modern industrial idea about how we manage water as a big central infrastructure. We just have that in our heads, that that's how we do it. Um, and that 
It doesn't work too badly in the US. I mean, in, in places like California, in the de you're trying to irrigate lots of crops in the desert. It creates quite a large downside, I think. But it kind of works. And we've imported that or exported that across the world to the extent that every country wants a Hoover Dam. It's almost literally true if you go through Africa and Asia. If they don't have one, every country wants something like the Hoover Dam because they you know the and they think that's how it should be done. And the, these sort of modernist methods of managing water have largely replaced, and you see it very clearly in India, um, largely replaced traditional systems of capturing water locally. I mean, India has thousands and thousands and thousands of abandoned, usually, old ponds, which were, may look like just old ponds, and people tend to build on them and so on, uh, but actually were very cleverly built structures for capturing local rains. Um, no, I mean, there are technical reasons why there are problems with rainwater capturing. You can have quite, you can ev lose a lot of the water to evaporation if you just have a, a shallow pond at the surface. It's vulnerable to pollution, for sure. You have to think about that as an issue. But if you really are running out of water, I think it makes more sense to fix those problems than to try and rely on the large scale infrastructure with all the problems that go with that. Certainly, I mean, that is the experience of, if you like, thousands of villages in India. I mean, there are lots of social movements in India that, that do this. They're not really hydrologists going around and saying, you ought to organize your water this way. They tend to be religious groups or Gandhi-type groups with, you know, with their own political agendas and so on. But going around encouraging villages to do that, it really is taking off around the world. Um, in China, the, the, the Chinese government encourages villages in remote areas to do something similar. Aid agencies tend to encourage villages in Africa. But often, actually, often they don't need encouragement. I was in Kenya a few years ago. I noticed that they were doing something similar on the hillsides um, outside Nairobi, the capital. So I said, well, you know, why, why is this happening? Where did you get this? I hadn't seen this in Africa before then. And they said, well, some of our guys years ago... Um, during the Second World War, in fact, had some of our, old, our elders had, gone, had worked in, w with Indians in the Indian Army during the Second World War. And when they'd been in India, they'd seen how Indians were organizing their, their water in this kind of way. And when they came home and we realized that we had drought problems here, they said, hey, what did they do? In I remember what they did in India. They started building the thing there. So you don't always have to have sort of outside agencies coming in. Very often people will come up with the solutions themselves or will have spot an idea from somewhere else. So, I mean, I guess the answer to your question is um, probably technological hubris. But I think, you know, sensible communities capable of thinking things th through themselves are capable of breaking through that and coming up with some better ideas. Another reason for my optimism. Um, I think we can come up with solutions and sensible ones if we really put our minds to it. Yeah, this one here. Um, at the beginning Sorry. of your presentation, you had quantified the problem, you know, with the hamburger and so on. Yeah. Um, if you quantified a solution like the drip, irriga like drip irrigation, like you yeah. mentioned, how far does it get agriculture towards resolving the issue? Well, it can reduce, as I said, water use by 40 or 50 or 60 percent, um, 70 or 80 percent if, if the soil circumstances and so on are right. So... It gets us quite a long way. I mean, it allows us to grow, I don't know, I'm making these numbers up really, and I certainly don't have a reference for them, but it might allow us to grow twice as much food as we do now by simply being more efficient in the way that we use the water. And that's pretty good. Because um, remember, we already grow enough food to feed 10 billion people. The planet has 7 billion people now. We grow enough food to feed 10 billion people, but we feed quite a lot of that uh, quite a lot of that grain to animals uh, which reduces the amount of protein that we get at the end of the day so if we, if we, if we all went vegetarian we'd, be, we'd, we'd uh, feed 10 billion people put it that way um, so if you have those water inefficien efficiencies then in water terms we could right now with existing crops technology uh, produce enough feed for 20 billion people on the planet nearly three times as many people as we have um, I have a friend in the UK who wrote a book somewhat facetiously called Feeding the World is Easy. Uh, it's kind of true if you do things right. Uh, as I said, I think the problems are not 
so much technological. We know what the technological solutions are very often. It's a matter of organizing ourselves to do it. Um. Um, I'm wondering for the countries that use desalination for their water, where yeah. the salt that's um, excreted from the water goes and what sort of challenges and issues this creates? Uh, locally, quite big problems from the, the effluent from uh, left over after you, the, the salts basically left over after you've produced the, the fresh water. Um, some of them manage them well. Mostly they just chuck them back in the oceans. Um, I was recently in Jeddah in Saudi Arabia where they said that huge areas of coral reefs upstream from the uh, the large desalination plant there had been pretty much destroyed by the effluent coming out from the desalination plant. So, yeah, there are, there are big issues about that. Um, they're probably solvable um, if you want to, but very often they don't really care, so they don't. Uh, there was a question down the front here. Yeah. Uh, they're not that efficient, but they take enough moisture out to keep a small town going. Uh, if, you, if you cover a hillside with um, a whole series of uh, um, kind of meshes or mats... Um, the, the idea was um, pioneered in, in Chile uh, a few years ago, but I've seen it on one of the islands in the Canary Islands, the Spanish Canary Islands in the Atlantic Ocean, where they don't get much reliable rain and they've been pumping out their underground water reserves. Uh, it's been tried in Namibia. There are quite a lot of places on the west side of continents where they have these cold upwelling waters and winds coming in off the ocean produce these fogs. They often get very little rain, virtually no rain. The, the Chilean example is, is actually in the Atacama Desert, which is the driest place on the planet, pretty much. You can go five, ten years and not have any rain at all there, but they get these fogs right on the coast. So it's a really valuable resource under those kind of circumstances. I don't know if yeah. this is true. Just somebody told me that China was the largest exporter of bottled water now. And when we consider what we saw in Michigan, that seems to be really undercutting their very survival. <laughs> Do you know if that's accurate? I've, I've never heard that said. I'd be quite surprised. But China is the, so, is the biggest of so many things that it's not. I know the biggest, wa the biggest users of bottled water um, are, is Mexico. Um, I think partly because their local water supplies are not terribly reliable and all the, the quality of them is not terribly reliable, but also pro presumably because uh, of uh, an infusion of, of American companies encouraging them to do that. Uh, I, no, I've not heard that about China. It's, uh, I'll, I'll check to see if it's true, but uh, as I say, China is so big it's possible. I've, I don't think I've ever drunk a bottle which said it was from China. I have drunk water which claimed to come from Fiji, and it claimed to be environmentally friendly, which I could not believe. Um, I think they, they bought some rainforest and claimed that all the emissions from trucking and shipping wa this bottled water all the way from Fiji in the middle of the South Pacific, um, they claimed they'd offset all the carbon emissions. But it struck me as the, as the height of kind of insanity to be importing. But I mean, for me, actually, the main problem about bottled water is not so much... Well, it, it, it's because they get, it's corporate and it's branded and companies like Nestle make money out of it, which strikes me as, as pretty unpleasant. But in, in water terms, generally speaking, it probably doesn't make... It's not a big water supply problem. There may be very local problems, but they're, they're, not, produ they're not delivering more water than you and I would take by uh, turning, on the, turning on the faucet. But the energy involved in shipping bottled water around the planet is insane. Um, you know, rather than putting it in a pipe and delivering it largely by gravity, you're putting it in these plastic bottles, putting it on trucks, or in the case of Fiji, in ships, and moving it around the planet. And that's, I think, the big environmental footprint of bottled water. Uh, there are local problems, so I don't deny that, but I think the big, the big issue is it's just an insane waste of water. It's like, it's like d it's desalinating seawater when you don't need to. Just the energy involved in doing it is um, uh, not very environmentally friendly, let's put it that way. Hi. In Hi. regards to the desalination, my son uh, uh, spent uh, a couple of years over in Australia, mm. and he went there because he's a water engineer, and he uh, 
heard that they had the most desalination plants in the world, which apparently they do have. Mm. And, and you heard someone say the big drought that they had for all those years. Well, you can imagine why the desalination is important there. Uh, I think a couple of places in the United States have desalination plants. Mm. Uh, I, there's one down in Key West they don't want to use much, but if they need to, they will mm. in, at the t in Key West, Florida. And uh, the problem is a, a cost. I don't think that's been licked yet. I think that's being researched by graduate students. One of them I heard had an answer, but uh, until that cost gets down in this country anyway, uh, it's, it's uh, something in the future. But it is mm. definitely relied upon in Australia, and they have loads of coral outside of Australia. Yeah, I, mean, I, I, may, I may be wrong, but I think mostly in Australia they're not desalinating seawater. They have a lot of underground water reserves that are quite saline, not as salty as seawater, but brackish. Um, and I think they do a lot of desalination of those underground water reserves. Now, I mean, tell me if I'm wrong, but that's my understanding. They have some desalination of seawater, but a lot of it is this brackish water from underground. Um, and in some parts of Australia, obviously that makes sense if that's the only underground water you've got. What they do with the, uh, the waste, well, it probably won't go in the ocean, um, so probably the Great Barrier Reef is safe from that. But uh, I would imagine it's quite, a, it's quite an issue to keep that away from, because if you just dump it on the ground, it would probably go back underground and uh, pollute some more water somewhere. Uh. Okay, please join me in thanking Fred Pierce again. Thank you.